but it was like, uh, you know, there were a couple of versions we had done where it was really, really, really good. But it wasn't perfect, it wasn't amazing. And I'm not that artist, you know, I'm not the guy who won't finish it because it's not perfect yet, you know, that's much more Duncan than me. And I applaud that, by the way. I, I, I wish I had more of that extra mile in me. I'm more like a big picture. <laughs> but, um, but this one was so important to me that it had to be, if it's going to be the thing forever, Hello and welcome into another edition of Chi Time, your conscious living show with me, Clara Apollo. And mm -mm, as you know, I love to chat to people about energy work and how they're taking care of themselves and what their gifts are to the world and how they manage to b balance that whole work and play. Although for a lot of us these days, our work is our play. And I think that's kind of the best way of it being quite honestly. And in the hot seat today in Chi Time, on Chi Time, I have for you a real player and purveyor of incredible arts actually. We've got Jamie Catto here. He is an author and an activist. He's a creator and a catalyst. He's a musician and a filmmaker and, and uh, as I said, a purveyor of shadow busting mojo motivating workshops. But he's here today on Chi Time to talk about his new film that's coming out in the autumn about Ram Das called Becoming Nobody. So welcome back to Chi Time, Jamie. Hi there. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And it's a Monday morning here that we're uh, recording this and we've been kind of sliding about with this date, haven't we? And mm -hmm. I think the first one that we would we try to do, you had to nudge it because you were doing some stuff with the Extinction Rebellion crew. So can you tell us about what you were doing or is that top secret? It's kind of top secret, but just the overview is that, you know, they are very, very committed. They're the first organisation of this, of this type, shall we say movement where there's a, a real diligence and commitment to being on a twin trail. Uh, it's not just pointing the finger at the thing outside that's wrong and externally yang addressing it. They really want to balance it with the yin of listening before you do anything, pause, mm -hmm. stop, listen, feel, then act. Uh, that's been largely absent in most activism and in, because there's such an urgency, even more so with Extinction Rebellion, there's even more urgency. It's even more important to have the balance of inner listening, inner work. How does my judgmental self-righteousness come out when I see those people? How am I you know, losing my compassion or dehumanizing those people? How am I slightly wanting revenge on those people? How am I, the patterns which block me in my activism playing out in other areas of my life? How can I self-care most so that when I'm in these incredibly intense situations that I can still stay present and myself and not be collapsed and sent into sleep or spiritual sleep, if we call it that, um, while my reactions, which are convincing me, that's really how I think. This is, you know, at the moment we're triggered, at the moment we're reactive, we're really sure that those values and those actions are true for us. They aren't. The real wise kind of us is wise kind part of us has fallen asleep uh, and to know the difference so there's a lot of inner work needed to be a sustainable and efficient activist oh you're so right absolutely spot on all of all of what you just said and more cool so, so that's back. a part of my offering for the gang yeah and they were doing a big session this week to debrief where they've been so far and start visioning whatever next yeah of course and they Wonder didn't the you know there was not enough time to do everything but it was even just to get the main i wouldn't say the main but 50 of the people who are actually on the ground always doing it strategizing decision making the different they've got different departments the way they speak in a circle is so respectful and mm. they know how to facilitate each other which is why even though there's been a lot of chaos and a lot of things that have been conflict and difficult within the ranks they're still here still trying to work it out you know what i mean yeah. a lot of people would have folded with the amount of pressure and the amount of chaos and the amount of different kinds of personalities with different passions they've really done well to still be rocking along that is but that's what's so needed now in these changing 
tumultuous times, can't even speak right, uh, uh, that we, you know, we learn how to work together when we do have differing opinions. I mean, this has got to be one of the key aspects of moving forwards in a, in a conscious society, yeah? Yeah, and you, you add certain pressures to that, like a time pressure, which Extinction Rebellion is all about, like a big spread, you know, like past prejudices about oneself or others. You know, there are all kinds of taboos. The, the themes of this week were power, privilege, patriarchy, and racism. Just a few little gentle, gentle subjects to touch upon with 50 very, very passionate yeah. people. And of course, if you're fighting or if you're wanting to heal the world in those areas, like activists do, hopefully, it means probably that you have been slightly extra wounded by those things in your life, which is why it sent you into wanting to stand up for those like you who were suffering at the hands of ignorance. And um, so it's not, a, it's also an extra pressure into the soup that you're dealing, that all of us that want to fight those things have been hurt by them. So it means we'll have more trigger triggers around them than the next person. Mm -hmm. That's why the people who aren't activists about that thing, what's the, what's the problem with us about? Because they haven't been hit by it, you know. Right. What wow. you choose to be an activist about says everything about your, where you yeah. came from, you know, and your, yeah. work, your sculpting. Sure. And we could go on about this. Maybe we'll have another cheat time about this, but, um... Should we get into becoming nobody? Yeah, yeah, sure. So how did you first meet Ram Dass then? How did that happen? Was it the one giant leap film or had you met him before that? Long before, when I was uh, 25, having already fallen head over heels in love with him mm. in Savasana in many yoga classes, they would put on a Ram Dass cassette <laughs> in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... I just absolutely, the moment I heard him talking, I felt I, part of me came home. It was a bit like the first time I heard Peter Gabriel's lyrics, or Peter Gabriel's music. I thought, wow, he's speaking just to me. And you know, when you have those experiences, you know you will be connected to that teacher or singer or a band forever. So it was very much like that for me with Ram Dass and very much like that Peter Gabriel and various others. And um, then, yeah, a few years after that, which was my early 20s, my girlfriend was pregnant and he, he was doing a retreat in some old boarding school in England they'd rented for some part of the summer. I was definitely there. And I think it was the first thing I went to on my own voluntarily in my life, like where I was just like, I'm into this, I'm going. It wasn't like I was going along with other people that were going or, you know, I was just like, I'm not sure even I've told very much, you know, like I was just like, off I went, you know, and uh, really had a transformational, beautiful experience and always love the fact that he's not one of those teachers even though he he's sort of like up there he still cues in the lunch queue with everyone else he doesn't say oh i need to go and meditate because i've been holding all your energy i'll see you all after the break you know he he just hangs out with everybody and like stands in the queue with the canteen uh, we had lunch a couple of times um and then and then later then then we stayed a bit in touch and whenever I would get in a pickle I would call him and he was very like never would even you'll notice it all the way through the film he still won't play my game that I'm coming for do you know what I mean just not having it like the projections and uh so like you know I said to him as it says in the film when we were first having lunch back back then in the canteen when I was 25 you know I think I've come all this way for you to sh tell me that I'm a good son and he looked at me and went, well, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Just like not buying, not playing. And you can see in the film Becoming Nobody how the, I'm still trying to get anointed. In fact, I do, I do think I say it right at the beginning of the film. He says, what are you doing here? As if to say, what are you still doing here? But he says, you know, what, what, what do you want? And I said, I told you to get the keys to the executive spiritual washroom. <laughs> so that's, that's that part of the film is... Me trying to get acknowledged as his son and heir and uh, not managing to us laughing our tits off in the process of noticing me doing that, plus all the best of his archive of all my favourite bits of Ram Dass. The, the point of the film is for it to be the one-stop film that if you're interested in Ram Dass and you really want to get his transmission, not just he was born, and it's not biographical, 
doesn't say anything about his biography apart from him meeting Tim Leary and taking acid or meeting his guru. That's about all the biography there is in the, <clears throat> the whole thing is really his best bits of incredible transmission and hilarious. I noticed none of the other Ramdas films have any funny bits in. Uh, and he's the funniest clown of any teacher, you know, and most of the other things are all very uh, so spiritual. It was just so touching. And that is, that's there too. Obviously there's a lot of that, but, but it's, it's really as many of the funny bits as they'd let me keep. Um, so I went to the Ramdas people. I said, I want to make the Ramdas film, not a Ramdas film. I want to make the one where you see it and you just get him and get it and get the meat transmission for long after he's dead for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm. And they were totally, they loved him in the first one giant leap and the second one giant leap. So they know that I have a history. Um, even though I wasn't working with Duncan, they know that I get him. Mm. So they gave you permission and he gave you permission and you gave you permission to follow through with what was wanting to birth through you. Yeah, I feel like I can really die happy after this piece of work. More than one giant leap, more than, certainly more than yeah. obviously and things like that. But, um, you know, this, this is like, it's, this exists forever. This is the great thing about when you finish an album or finish a film. Like I was in Amsterdam recently and, um, I was passing by the Apple shop, which in, uh, I didn't go in, in it, but I was passing by that corner where it is and uh, by the American hotel. And it's all like gleaming glass and chrome kind of building. And on the, on the lower bit of it, where the pavement level, of course is Amsterdam. People have slapped some bill posters all over the lower level. And there's one of a classical concert of Schubert. And it's a very, they've used a very old sort of 18th century or 19th century, whatever it is, image of Schubert and I just thought imagine if Schubert could see this corner uh, he was like dealing with horses and carts there was no industrial revolution yet you know like it was like and, uh, and suddenly you placed him in 2019 in Amsterdam with this gleaming apple store and there's a picture of him people are still coming to his gigs <laughs> imagine what you would think like anyway I think about that when like we who's going to hear our stuff, our music, the internal album, whatever, one giant leap in the future. And with the Ramdas thing, it's like, this is going to be like forever. When, when we all live in space pods orbiting Venus in the year 3721, people will be able to say, oh, can you watch uh, Becoming Nobody and get the Ramdas hit? You know, like, who knows? It might be, it's forever when you finish something. Well, it is, as long as it's on a format that you can access in the year 3030. No, because everything becomes <laughs> upgraded as people want it. Of course. It's not about of course. that at all. Yeah. You know, you didn't, yeah. Schubert wasn't on a format, you could, you know, apart from live. No, but it was written, though, wasn't it? It was written as, as notes, and that's yeah. how it's able to come but through. Anything yeah. people want to carry on with, yeah, for sure. They'll, they'll upgrade to digital or whatever they'll do with it, you know. They will. And I love that with Becoming Nobody is <clears throat> mm. something which is vibrating the way that the Becoming Nobody film is because it's, it's so full of love. It's so full of laughter and it's so full of wisdom. It's like, <laughs> and it's going off into the world. And all the people that copy it and get it, it's just like, it's a positive virus. Love it. Should we play a track for listeners? What have you got for us first then, Jamie? Are you going to play Chances Are? Did we say we were going to play Chances yeah, Are? Yeah, because that, that's in the trailer that's out at the moment and obviously therefore in the album. Can you tell us? I might us need a bit of a long lead in to tell you about it. It's quite a long story. I could try and tell you as quickly as possible. Why Go on, do a, do a succinct version of this then. Okay. Yes, you can. When I first got my first ever paycheck from Faithless, I was so amazed that after seven years of non-stop musicianing that I was finally getting paid that I took the first royalty check I had that was about nine grand or something and I spent it all on Dave Stewart's church studios in Crouch End and the best musicians that I could persuade to come and candle makers and caterers. And I wanted to make an album which had nothing to do with the charts or anything that was commercial, just everyone loving their craft of music, collaborating together. It's like a film score for a movie that doesn't exist. And we had the Faithless Rhythm section and Liam from Hot House Flowers and Kelly from the Sneaker Pimps, who was singing this song called Six Underground at the time, and Mike Rowe, the Oasis keyboard player, and DJ Swamp from Beck's Band, the Scratch DJ, and all these other musicians that you wouldn't have heard of, all descended. 
and all collaborated and tried out different stuff. And, and in one particular lunch break, he made an amazing album called As Deep As We Can Go Without Drowning by The Happening. It was the first Happening album, which features on the Ramdas uh, film Becoming Nobody. We used quite a few tracks from it. And one of them was a lunch break when DJ Swamp, the, the scratch DJ from Beck's group, was hanging out with the African xylophone player. And they started communicating sonically and with no intention that the track would even be, you know, it just became this thing. And I think that, that Dave or Paulie put some acoustic guitar on and it was just really, when you know that it's a scratch playing with the xylophone and what he does, he's just showing his eyes, just showing off basically, but it's so wonderful to listen to. Loving that track. Thank you, Jamie, for choosing that and explaining how it got recorded. Uh, it's so fascinating when you talk about the music and how things come through and this sort of freedom and flow that you, you have running through your life. Has it got more like that? Let go of a lot of resistance to things. You know, I'm not living a life that says there should only be pleasure, never pain. There can only be comfort, never discomfort. And in fact, I've been on a bit of a quest to not only stop resisting discomfort, but maybe even on the better days, um, harvest it for treasure. So, you know, my resistance, my particular kinds of resistance, the way I'm resisting, what the content of my thoughts is in those moments, actually is quite illuminating for lots of beliefs I'm running, lots of ways I'm meeting the world that aren't actually true for me. That's why they don't feel nice. <laughs> So um, if I'm out of alignment, my soul tends to show me through discomfort or external collapse or, um, or lack of flow. Yeah. Um, so um, that always makes me ask five questions. My unpretentiously named, I'm creating my own Taoist mythology, basically. I've got the secret of the eight bowls that I pretend is a Taoist ancient thing that I fully made up. Although maybe I think that actually is an eight bowls practice. It's just not the thing I was talking about. Anyway, the, the unpretentiously named five golden keys of alchemy are whenever anything's going on that I don't want or the, you know, that breaks the flow or is upsetting or unexpected is if I had set this all up as a training and then forgotten about it, what am I trying to show myself? And you sit in the yin and just see what comes back. Or you can ask the pain in your body, that the stress that's going on during the event. If your throat's feeling tight or your chest is feeling pressured, you can ask that feeling and sit in the yin. And it will tell you that's the whole point of the energetic genius system of the body. It's not just to flush out the unwanted accumulation, but it's also those feelings are saying, ask here. This is the part of the body that wants to tell you. Mm. If you can sit in the yin and allow the feelings that are edgy, not everyone can. The second unpretentiously named key of alchemy is um, to ask if this, if this was a signpost for me to be reminded to self-care in a way that I've forgotten to or ne neglected to, what might it be? How might this be a signpost for me to be reminded to self-care in a particular way? That always yields some treasure. Mm. The third question that we sit in and we ask is, how is this an opportunity for me to be more honest, show up more, be more vulnerable or authentic? The fourth one is, how does this hurt more because of my painful past? Mm -hmm. And the fifth one is, through all this, what are the gifts I can share with others? And if you apply those, that key ring to pretty much anything that's going on, you will transform it. Mm -hmm. But this is taking time to be self-reflective. And you were so right, you're saying that the body tries to talk to us, you know, it gives us pain, it gives us discomfort because it's going, oi, over here, a bit of self-reflective time. And this is what we're lacking so much in this day and age of multi-distractions and only, you know, um, finite amount of hours and an infinite amount of things to do in those hours. And to, to, to self-choose, um, to, to choose self-care, you know, it's just down the list of priorities and until the body screams and go, no, 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 you really do need to be looking at this now. And it's a, it's giving yourself time, space is so, is so key. And this, this core listening. So thank you for sharing that with us here, Jamie. Mm. Um, 
so moving back to the or moving forward to the becoming nobody film with ram das that is coming up when is that being released when is that happening? america in the first week of september and when in in the uk they will be you know the distributors mm. and the people that kindly paid for the film are all american oh okay so it's um, ram das's operation is a u.s operation Love Serve Remember Foundation, who ended up funding the film in the end. Um, so they're really only concerned with America right now. Okay. Um, and that will the rest of the world will happen probably towards Christmas or I imagine in the new year. Right. However, I am doing illegal secret screenings in various places and I'm going to do one at Buddha Field. Yeah. Because one giant leap, yeah. we're doing a performance on Saturday night first one in 10 years oh. at, at Budderfield. What date is that, Jamie? Oh, that's a good question. Let me look in the diary. I'm going to put you on oh, the spot it's, there. Oh, it's the weekend after Bath and Bournemouth. So it's the next weekend, 19th, 20th, 21st of July. Then Saturday night, mm. the 20th is the one giant leap thing. We're not revealing yet when the secret screening is. Oh, okay. Well, good job. This show's going to initially be aired just before that goes out. It's the only time I've said it out loud because it's a secret. So your show is going to be the only time anyone hears it. Quiet then. I'm going to be in France, otherwise I'd be there like a shot. Really would be so good to experience not only the film, but also one giant leap. So let's, oh, we're going to, we're sliding ahead because I know you've got a new project running, haven't you, with that. So, mm. but yeah, let's do that another time. So back to becoming nobody if we can. Um, this whole, the, the, the teaching, the teachings, I've just been chatting with Tim Freak about um, the one in, into the 10,000 things and back to the one again, because he's brought in this new word called univigilism. I think I've said it right. Um, where when we really embrace our individuality enough to be free with how we express it and we then work in collaboration with everyone else, we then become a bigger version of the one because it is, this is the Taoist principle, isn't it? That the that it, um, Tao is expressing itself through each of us in individual ways because not one of us can do everything. We all need to have our own, yeah, um, gifts and talents and uniqueness coming through. But behind all that, the, the presence, the one, we really are all, all one. And is this what this becoming nobody is, a, is about, loosely or definitely? Yes, it is that when the part of you that is driving things which considers itself to be somebody and has been trained to be somebody your whole life which is your ego even though the ego is not a dirty word it's just your interface with earth and your list of protections and fantasies when that part is in the driving seat which it is for most people most of the day um you're very limited in um your experience of the whole of life when the part of you which is not sucked into all the dramas of life which is what we for now we'll call the soul part of you uh, the part of you that's loving and kind and trust that there's a bigger picture than just the scrabbling around being a grasping human when that tv channel is optional as well alongside the ego one not instead of mm -hmm. alongside it you become much less concerned with what do i want How's this, how are people looking at me? It's much less about that. And it's much more we. It's much more yin. It's much more what we might call feminine values, not wanting to start gender arguments. Um, and generous and nurturing. And it would never let the children or the old people suffer the way they do so that billionaires can have huge hordes of wealth. It wouldn't, it just, it's insane. We wouldn't deal with that insanity. Um, so when you want nothing you become an irresistible force yeah you can't be manipulated into the whole mechanics of advertising won't touch you don't need anything don't need it because so isn't it um joe Dispenza that talks about becoming no thing nowhere no in no time so this whole it's linking with that, isn't it? Becoming nobody, where you you take a step back and you you disengage from the um, the, the shackles of the ego, and this sort of three D world into the into the reality of the soul. And 
you know, Ram Das in all his amazing wisdom, and because he was a, a Harvard psychologist, wasn't he? So he did all his brain work training early on. He was very interested in the mind and how it develops. Oh yeah, it's because they were doing circles of psychotherapy on acid that they and wouldn't stop that they all got kicked out. Oh, was that was that what what happened? Yeah. It was when the American government wanted to make LSD illegal and just try it out on the Vietnam soldiers and do all that shit. Um, that, that anyone else who was in the mainstream that was doing it had to be like demonized. And him and Tim Leary were kicked out as Harvard dons or whatever they were, professors. Mm -hmm. And Tim Leary went more into psychedelics kind of thing, I think. And, and Ram Dass went off to India and discovered that... Maharishi, yeah. It was his pathway to the thing that acid promises, but you always have to leave when it wears off. He says, then I met Maharaji and I met a man that didn't come down. Yeah, yeah. exactly. exactly. And he, just, he, he also tells a story about how, you know, in, in meditation, there's no one there sort of policing. There's no one there that's there with, with, with your mind. And you could be thinking about anything. I think he talks about having isn't it, a six hour sexual fantasy and, and nobody knows. And that, that, and that is so true. It's about where you are, your relationship with yourself. And it's not about saying, oh, I, I did this and aren't I doing well? It's like, how is this feeling for you? How is this resonating with you and your connection to the divine or your connection with your soul and your connection to your, your deeper inner reality? And that, to me, is really core of his teachings. Yeah. Jamie's well, tapping something. Something's coming through. I don't know if there was one app that was left on. Get rid of it. There you are. Sorry, you might have to edit that bit out. Yeah, well. Yes, yeah, so that's really the, the core of his teachings is the self relationship. And that's the core of your teachings, too, isn't it? What, what you facilitate. Well, yeah. I mean, he's, the core of his teachings now is just loving kindness. Mm. It's as simple as that. He's not really, that's the funny one. I talk about it in the film about this life hack or that aspect. He's like, you know, I used to dabble in that stuff, all the psychological blah, 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 and the unloved parts. I just go straight for their soul, is what he says. Yeah, but he, he can. You know, he spent all his life on that. Can. Anyone yeah. can. Okay, and then he had that massive wake-up call, didn't he, in 1997 when he had a, the stroke and then created that film, Fierce Grace, which is just so poignant and incredible that, you know, that some... And how often is it that people require a wake up call to get to the next level of well waking up that's why it's called a wake up call isn't it we kind of yeah. are shaken into you really need to be looking at something now your soul is crying for your next level of what you're here to learn whilst you're on the planet hmm. maybe may maybe not maybe not maybe it's all just like we've just got to be going somewhere we can't just be here now yeah so, but isn't loving kindness what we all like aspire and hope to? I mean, we can do it intellectually, but how do we actually embody that for real? By really looking at the truth that everyone's innocent and everyone was once a lovely baby. And any way that you're reacting is because even if they're wrong and even if they've done something we would all agree isn't okay, your reaction to it, though totally human, is yours. And if someone fires an arrow into your shoulder and walks off, it's still you that's got to go to the hospital and get it taken out. And the truth of it is that every abuser was once a lovely baby. And yes, you need to lick your own wounds and get healing. But, you know, the truth is that we need high security hospitals, not prisons. The idea of punishment is backward. You know, out of all the people who do terrible things, some people say, well, I had a hard childhood and I didn't do those terrible things. Yeah, but you, you read the right book, you met the right social worker, you had the right realisation at the right moment. Great. You didn't become an abuser. But that's lucky for you. That's not making you better. The ones that became the abusers didn't get the help or they did get the help. but They didn't understand the help or they do whatever it was. It obviously didn't work. And that's bad for them. It's not like therefore they're bad people. It means that they're, they're unlucky people at its true level. Now, if someone hurts someone you love, it's almost impossible to practice that because of the, the grief and the anguish and the lack of control. And, you know, if someone did something to one of my kids or something, I'm not saying I could apply what I just said, but I still know it to be true. Oh, 
Wow, that is so, exactly, yeah. Yeah, you know it to be true deep, deep down, but there's those levels of personality and being an experience that might struggle with it if you were put in an extreme situation. So do you think that everybody is inherently good? That there's that goodness is, as you say, everyone, when they're born as a baby, comes through with that you know, deep connection to soul for a start um, and ready to learn and be and share the goodness of their heart. I, I wouldn't like to presume, but from the patterns one sees, it could be that there's some sort of kinky thing about disconnecting so that one can connect again. You come into individuality and forget your connection so that you can re find your connection mm. and then be a guiding light for others that have lost their connection. Mm. Possibly that's one of the patterns that does seem to play out, mm. Mm. but it's all a really a, a mystery to me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really thinking about the overall picture as much. I'm thinking about loving kindness in the moment, excitement in the moment, laughter in the moment, mischief in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And trusting that the big picture will take care of itself. You're so right. Cause the moment's all we actually really know. And that was, was key uh, dipping into Ram Dass and, and his work and bravo to you for bringing this film together. Cause it, you know, it did take you a little while for it to come to actually come out, didn't it? I started, stopped and started and, and everyone was very patient with me. But it was like, I, you know, there were a couple of versions we had done where it was really, really, really good. But it wasn't perfect. It wasn't amazing. And I'm not that artist, you know, I'm not the guy who won't finish it because it's not perfect yet. You know, that's much more Duncan than me. And I applaud that, by the way. I, I, I wish I had more of that extra mile in me. I'm more like a big picture. <laughs> But, um, but this one was so important to me that it had to be, if it's going to be the thing forever, then I really want it to be just right. And, and they let me scrap the whole thing and start again three times. Not that they, I mean, let me, I, did, I didn't go over budget or anything. I just, and there was never any deadline. It was just like, I just really uh, had to eat humble pie and say, look, I know it's, it's getting good, but like, I need to start all over again. <laughs> because <laughs> i knew that i did and i knew it's embarrassing to say so but i had to step through the embarrassment and say that this is what's true i know this is embarrassing and everyone's gonna have to wait longer and all your, the people on the ramdas board are like when's the fucking guy going to produce something you know you just had to sit we all had to and ragu the my other producer who's one of the you know people who run the foundation He's a super close friend as well. He took the heat each time. He totally trusted me. And he knew, because we see eye to eye in creativity, actually. You know, that every time there was a discussion about this shot or that shot, or is this bit too loud, or does that bit move there? We pretty much always had exactly the same opinion. So we never had any creative struggles, like one or two things that, that, that we didn't agree on, but it was minor. So he really, really was a great uh, buffer between me and the foundation and, and, and made, took the heat so that I could just get on creatively. And uh, that's a huge reason why it got finished. Yeah, that's a really good story and all of that collaboration of working and artists supporting one another. And what does Ram Dass think of it? Well, he doesn't really deal on that level anymore of giving you kudos, you know, giving you like kind of big... Mm. If he doesn't give me, he's, he's gone way past the point where he's been clear to me that he's not giving me daddy praise. Uh, but we had, and, and when we said goodbye after we did the final interview, we looked at each other and then he said an extra, he like took my hands and he went, goodbye. Like, this is the last time we're going to see each other in this lifetime. You know, that's what it felt like. It was really clear saying to me, like, uh, and I really felt that it was a very emotional time after having left. Like I felt I'd really said goodbye. And I haven't, we haven't been interacting through the movie. He said to me, there's an interesting way that you could edit this. And I knew exactly what he meant and did try to do what he said, which is he said, don't try and glorify yourself. Be the mess you were during, you know, be, reveal what our dynamic was here so people can see not to deify other people. You know what I mean? It was really, so that's very much me being the guy who's failing to get anointed is a theme in the film. 
<laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't come across as handsome as and enlightened as you see me now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Take them out of the team. But um, re recently, they had the first screening at, in the map to open the Maui Film Festival in Hawaii. And it was a big smash and like 800 people, immense screen, you know, and it was, they all laughed at the right minutes and cried at the right minute. And I wasn't there, but you know, they, I got a call straight after with everyone jumping up and down and so excited and moved and it was a really good vibe. And uh, then I, when I was having a meeting with Ragu, he happened to be at the kitchen table around us. He said, there's someone that wants to speak to you. It was like totally unexpected. And he comes and we, we chatted for a bit. And it was so sweet. He goes, it's a smash, Jamie. And he was all like, just so happy. And uh, I was all happy. And then at the end, I just said, you know, thank you. And he turned around to me and he touched his forehead. And he went, no, thank you. And that was, I think, you know, that was my little, uh, my little bit of uh, what the Yiddish people would say, schlepping nachas. Okay. <laughs> but, you know. It's funny because I make a lot of jokes about my film and my this, my that, because the whole thing is about to be about being becoming nobody. Yes, of course. <laughs> Have you seen my new film? Oh, it's amazing. You know, it's like the, the whole point of putting something out there. I'm touring America for five weeks from mm -hmm. the beginning of September into October to going to the 25 places that it's the cinemas, the cities where it's coming out in the cinema. Sedona, Texas, LA, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Boulder, Colorado, all yes. the way across to New York. Yes. Uh, being no, becoming nobody. Becoming nobody. So it's not actually your film. It is just a film. I know, but I want lots of people fluffing my fragile ego. So we've got well, to find a place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the balance. Oh. Oh, well, good luck with that one. And, um, and thank you so much for, for sharing um, some of your, your story around all of this. I really appreciate that um, open, honest vulnerability here that you've um, yeah, shared with us this morning. So have you got another track that you would like to play, listeners, before we go? Yeah, this is a track that for some reason we didn't include on the internal Music for Dissolving album, which... <laughs> is a lot of the music of the movie. We've used it for a lot of that. Alex, who mostly made that album uh, with me, also sound mixed the film. Um, but there was one film we did, one song we didn't include on that at record, which has moved me for years. I just love it so much. It moves me so much. And it reminds me of when I was a young boy, I had a lot of loneliness. I normalized, apparently the, the therapists have told me I normalized loneliness. Um, and I used to experiment in my mind with taking myself in my brain to really lonely places and feel what it felt like to be able to almost handle it. So I would imagine I was certain places. And one of the things I used to do is I used to imagine I was leaving planet earth and going up through the sky into space. So I could see planet earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it was the same as a star. You couldn't, I closed my eyes and you actually didn't know which one it was mm. or which direction it was. You were just in nothing. And I would sit there and hang out and feel that aloneness and see if I could feel okay with it. Um, and I could, you know, I, I it was because when you take away the word loneliness, it has a different quality anyway. So this piece of music is called The Lonely Robot and is that state of being so alone in the middle of space, um, but not crying alone, but it is melancholy and it makes yearning happen. But maybe it's a beautiful yearning. I hope so. This track, uh, it, for me, is like some of the most beautiful. Yeah, it really touches me. Thank you. And this is the first time it's been aired, yeah? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us as well, Jamie, and for being part of Tea Time again. <laughs>